Tribe Church. My name is Pastor Carrie. Hi. And we are in part two, the last part of our series, Not In It to Win It. A series that I spent most of the month of September trying to talk Matt Dilly out of. And if you were here last week, you know that it's a very, very good thing that he did not listen to me. Uh, because we actually had to come in and paint this whole place last week uh, because right off these walls. Am I good on the mic? Are we good? Yeah, I know, right? He did. He was so good. Am I good on the mic? I didn't get it checked because I was running around again. Okay, thank you. Just making sure. Anyway, so I know we say this all the time, but seriously, if you missed last week's sermon, you need to go to our YouTube page. You go into the live tab. It'll be right there. Um, make sure that you have this. Make sure that you don't miss it. It's, it's so good. Um, and the thing is, I am, I am not one to shy away from difficult conversations. I am more than willing to cover difficult topics from the platform, and I have. But there is, there is just nothing that I like talking about less than politics. Nothing. There's nothing I like talking about less than politics. In fact, last spring when I was at a retreat for um, women pastors and leaders, the subject of politics came up, and I, I'm looking across this room, and I'm seeing people from across the country, women from across the country, and I'm like, this is going to get real ugly real fast. So I just shut it down. Uh, there's a room full of like 15 powerful women who speak on stages and, and lead companies and, and do really, really impressive things. And they're, they're trying to talk politics. And every time they open their mouths, I'm just like, you just point them to Jesus. And they're like, yeah, but what about? And I'm like, you just point them to Jesus. And they're like, yeah, but, but when, when, when she says this or he said that, and like, you just point them to Jesus. And they're like, what about when people do this? And you're like, you point them to Jesus. Because it's not your job to change their political beliefs. Contrary to popular belief, you don't have to engage in every political conversation that comes across your face, okay? It is not your job to talk about politics with people. It is your job to get people closer to our Heavenly Father and let Him sort out the rest. Amen. I know, it's, it, I know. I'm no Matt Dilley, right? And the people in that room did stop talking about politics and started talking about Jesus, and that was pretty cool. Um, and, and, and I think part of the reason that I feel so strongly the way that I do is that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that our brains, bodies, minds, souls, spirits, and hearts were not designed for a 24-hour news cycle. And, and so that's why I don't like to talk about politics. But here we are. So, uh, Not In It to Win It is not only the title of this series, it's actually a title of a book by Andy Stanley, from which most of the material, or a lot of the material and the jumping off points of this series was taken. So if you have loved this series, uh, that might be a good one for you to check out. And if you're frugal like me, it's on the Libby app, both in book and audio. The Libby app attaches your Kindle to your library card, and it's one of the greatest inventions of the 21st century. Um, if you like to own the book and you're frugal like me, the cheapest I found it is on eBay for about $5. Um, I cannot recommend eBay highly enough if you're the kind of person who occasionally needs to own a book. Um, those are free today. Um, Libby and eBay, those are my two great pieces of advice, which is actually the series that we just finished up a couple of weeks ago was our advice series. And then the one after this series is called I Deserve It that Jeff and Jason are going to preach and it's going to be awesome. And then it's at the movies and then it's Christmas and it's just the best time of the year and I have to talk about politics. <sighs> <laughs> 
So we are in a season where politics and political conversations, they seem unavoidable. And so I think our question today that we have to wrestle to the ground is, how do we navigate our, our po potential political differences in a way that points people to Jesus instead of alienating them from the church? Pastor Matt said last week that during the last election cycle, we watched churches align themselves with certain political stances and then just explode with growth in their churches. But it wasn't true church growth. It was not new people falling in love with Jesus. It was an echo chamber of people who already believed attending a new church that existed only to tell them what they already knew and what they wanted to hear. It's predatory behavior that preys on a scarcity mindset and tells you what to be afraid of and who's to blame for it. It's predatory behavior when it wraps a political idea in scripture and presents it from the platform as if thus saith the Lord. It's called Christian nationalism. It's disgusting and it's unchristlike. And while we're on the subject of disgusting, unchristlike, predatory behavior, Anytime any political party tells you you're not a Christian if you don't vote for us, that is predatory behavior. I'm not saying vote Democratic. I'm not saying vote Republican. I'm saying that if a political party is claiming your vote because you go to church, that doesn't give you the right to vote, and that is your right as an American. Okay? When they put a candidate in front of your face and they're like, you better vote for them because if you don't vote for them, you're not a Christian, that is not how it works. Honestly. Do you think these people think the way that you think, or do, they, do you think that they see a group, a large group of people, the evangelical vote, that represents a lot of people who will actually make it to the polls, and then they'll do or say whatever they have to do or say to get your vote? When it comes to politics and religion, it's not a which came first, the chicken or the egg situation. Was I a Christian first or was I a Republican first? Was I a Democrat first or was I a Jesus follower first? It's always Jesus first. It's always Jesus first. It's always, 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 always Jesus first. And that's why Pastor Matt and I and Tribe Church sit in the messy middle when it comes to politics. The messy, somebody's always a little bit mad at you, the messy, lonely middle. And again, over the last uh, couple of election sizes, we've, not just, we've watched not just churches, but people move further to the right or to the left. I thought it would be good to have kind of a little visual here. So we've got people who want to sit all the way. This is the left, right? Because this is my right, but that would be your left. That looks left for you. Okay. Do you see how it's confusing and blurry and complicated and messy? That's the whole thing. Okay. And then so if that was all the way to the left, this is all the way to the right. And they're pretty far away from each other. And what they do when they do this is they vacate that middle aisle. I forgot there was a third one. There's a third option. There's the middle aisle. And the problem is that the middle is where all the work gets done. The farther you move to the right or to the left, and I, I've watched this, I've seen this, you've probably watched and you've seen this, the farther you get away from those people over there, the farther you move to the right or the left, the farther you are from the people over there. And when you, when you come over to these, these far stances, the tighter you have to hold your political beliefs and stances. The farther you move to the right or to the left, the tighter you have to close your hands around the things that you think and you do and you say. The farther you move to the right or to the left, the farther you move away from the people on the other side, and the farther, the deeper you walk into the echo chamber. And if you're like, what's an echo chamber? Let me tell you what an echo chamber is. An echo chamber is an environment in which a person encounters only beliefs and opinions that coincide with their own so that their existing views are reinforced and alternative ideas are not even considered. But in the middle, it is so much easier to assume the posture of Jesus. It's so much easier to approach people 
the way Jesus approached them. Because you can see both sides. And there are good people on both sides of the aisle. And there are good points on both sides of the aisle. And that's why we sit in the middle as a church, as a couple, as individuals. That's why we sit in the middle. And the thing about sitting in the middle is it's not going to make you rich. It's not going to grow your church. It's not going to make you popular at big family gatherings. (laughs) But I sleep easier knowing that I don't sleep in an echo chamber. And I sleep easier knowing that I am free to consider ideas on both sides of the aisle. And I sleep easier knowing that Jesus is king And that is the most important thing. That's the only thing I want to hold on tight to in my life. And sitting in the middle is uncomfortable at first. Anything that's countercultural always is. It's always going to be uncomfortable at first. Christians need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because this agreement is unavoidable. And this isn't just true with our politics. Uh, It is true with our politics, but that's not the only place that it's true. It's true in our marriages. It's true with our children, at work, with our friends, in church. If you have ever had any interaction with another human person, you know that where two or more are gathered, there's going to be disagreement. (laughs) Okay? There's a tiny baby here today, and she and I had a disagreement because I wanted to hold her, and she was like, hey, my mom's over there. Have you met my mom? My mom is awesome. Okay, like, I, we, you know, it was a difference of opinion. I thought she was super cute, and I wanted to snuggle her. Apparently, that was too much. No, I'm just kidding. But we can, we can find disagreement just about any, anywhere. Where do we want to eat? How should we handle that? Should we buy or should we save? Frankly, half the time, I don't need another person to disagree. I can disagree with myself, right? So disagreement is unavoidable. Is unavoidable. But division is a choice. And you know this. You live this every day. You can have a disagreement in your marriage and not get divorced. You can have a disagreement with your child and maintain a relationship and even influence with them. A a disagreement doesn't have to divide divide you. It doesn't have to rip you in half. And yet, our nation remains deeply divided on every important issue. That's why it is so important for us as Christians to move towards the messy middle because it's in the messy middle that the work gets done. It's where you learn and grow. It's where you see people for who they are, not what they believe or what they think or what they think they think politically. Uh, A lot of you know that Pastor Matt and I are on a church planting lead team for the Aspire Network. And um, we were in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and... um, we were having a disagreement about how often our church planters should come to the events that we plan for them. We have like five or six big large group Zoom meetings a year. They're supposed to be meeting with a coach monthly and then we have two big conferences. And we need them to go to stuff because that's how they stay connected. We need them to go to stuff because we can't know what they need if they're not in front of us. And we need them to go to stuff because it's good for them. At the heart of this group of leaders, we don't want something from them. We want something for them. And so we were having a disagreement about how many times they could miss and still remain part of this program. And some of them wanted to say that they could miss a certain number of times, and other people wanted to weight certain things more heavily than others, like you could miss several of the Zooms if you were at the conference, and others wanted to just make it a percentage of things that they had to do to stay in the group. And I'm I'm listening to these people argue about this big, ineffable group of church planters. And I I did what I kind of always do in these situations. I thought to myself, what does this look like a year from now? If we pick percentage, or we pick weighting it, or we pick a certain number, like, what does this look like a year from now? And I looked around at these men and women who I love and who I know love people deeply. And I knew that if one of the planters that they had developed a relationship with 
was in that bottom percentage, the things that I would be hearing a year from now would sound something like this. They would be like, well, his mom died unexpectedly and he had to miss a whole bunch of stuff there, but they're back on track now. Or, I mean, she had to take a full-time job to help their church survive, so she can't come to the meetings during the week, but, but she watches those Zoom videos later. I promise she does. Or they had a baby that day, and so they missed that, and then they had to miss a couple of other things. Or they had to fire a staff member, and they were drowning for a little while, but they're, they're doing better now. Or maybe they have like a kid with special needs, and it's just really hard for them to get to things sometimes. And so I finally literally stood up in this room. We're all sitting. I stand up. And I said, the only thing that makes sense to me, it's like pornography. And I tell you, you want to get the attention of an entire room, you just say it's like pornography in a room like that. But it, but it is, because in 1964, Supreme Court Justice Porter Stewart said of pornography, it's almost impossible to define, but I know it when I see it. And whether or not these church planters were attending enough events, it was hard to describe, but we were going to know it if we saw it, right? And, and again, I know this group of leaders, and at their heart, they have this heart for church planting. And when it's this big, ineffable group, it's easy to want to hold their feet to the fire. But when it's a person standing in front of you, dealing with an issue you can't imagine, it is so much easier to have compassion for those people. It's easier to have compassion when it's a person than when it's a group to the right or to the left almost impossible to have compassion when it's this big ineffable group and they're on the other side and they're they're far away and they're scary when when you are so far to the right or to the left that the other group has become this big ineffable group of people it's almost impossible to have compassion for that group of people to see things from their perspective to know if what you're being told is a truth is the truth or a lie but when you take the time and you do the work to move towards the messy middle and poke around on how you really feel about the different issues, I think you're going to find that you're not as buttoned up as you thought you were. Things don't fit as nicely into the boxes that we're told that they do by the news station of our choice. And you're going to find that there are people on the other side of where you're currently sitting that are very smart like you're very smart that have strong character like you have strong character, that are not bad or evil, they're not stupid or soulless, they're just people who experienced life differently than you did. And just like I know those church planting leaders, I know the heartbeat of this church, and I know that a lot of you are closer to that messy middle than you might, not, than you might even be aware of. You might think that you're kind of the person who can stand on your side and write off an entire group of people, but you're not the kind of person who would write off a person who was standing in front of you. Even on the most divisive of topics, when you have a person in front of you, suddenly everything isn't so black and white anymore. Suddenly what was seemed clear and obvious and when it was this big ineffable group of people is now hazy and gray, it's complicated and it's messy. Because at the heart of every single issue that we're being told divides us is people. And fortunately for us, Jesus had a lot to say about how you should treat people. Jesus didn't size you up and write you off, but he could have. God doesn't stereotype you and dismiss you, but he could have. And so as Jesus followers and as Christians, we cannot size people up and write them off. We can't. The fact that God in his grace and mercy loves you anyway, despite the fact that you have messed up over and over and over again. The fact that God in his grace and mercy loves you anyway. And he's called for us to do for others what he has done for us. And it isn't easy because people are hard and messy and complicated. But it should be simple to understand. Because in every complicated situation I've ever been put in, in every situation where I might not know what to do based on my politics or their politics or the politics the world thinks that either one of us should have, I have always known what love required of me. I have always known what love required of me. And I'm betting you do too. Jesus didn't just model this for us. He didn't suggest it for us. He mandated it. 
for us. And honestly, if you're not a Christian here today, you can knock yourself out. You can demonize everybody. You can ostracize everybody. You can go to your side and just hunker down there and hold on to your whatever. You can call them whatever you want. Use whatever language you want. You can have fun with it. But if you consider yourself a Christian, a Jesus follower, what he said about how we should treat all of us affects all of us. And it's to love one another. This is the verse that I think we need to start holding up at football games. I think John 3, 16 is a little played out. It's great. I know, I know. I was planning on saying this, and then Vonda plays, for God so loved the world. Like, come on. <laughs> it's a great song. I love it. Thank you. But I think, man, if we started holding up John 13, 34, that might be people go, whoa, what is that? And then, like, they look it up, and they see this. Oh, my gosh, it says to love one another. That is, that is crazy. Jesus' love was active. If, you, if you're not sure what that means, just read the Gospels. If you want to know what love looks like and sounds like and smells like and reacts like, you can, you can just read the Gospels. Jesus was gracious and loving and patient and kind and direct and honest and compassionate. And his, his love leans in rather than pushing people away. And that was so important. He showed us over and over again throughout the Gospels, that we don't have to agree with someone to love them. And you're like, oh, yeah, you do. You have to agree with them to love them. Then I'm, I'm sorry, I guess you're not married. <laughs> and you, you don't have parents. And you probably don't have kids. <laughs> and you definitely don't have friends. Because anyone who's ever been in any kind of relationship with any other human knows that where two are more, or more are gathered, there's going to be disagreement. Disagreement over big things like how many guns we should be allowed to own. Oh, I know. Disagreement over little things like where are we going for lunch today? Last week, Pastor Matt preached the paint off the walls. He gets in the car. He's like, I want Mizu. Everybody else in the car is like, Jersey Mike's. And we went to Jersey Mike's, and he wanted Mizu, but we didn't get divorced. We made it, guys. We made it through. We didn't let division rip our family apart. Okay? I love Jersey Mike's. It's fine. Um, Jesus tells us that we have to love one another actively, compassionately. And he, he says it because it's what he's done for us. We can, degree, we can disagree politically, but we still have to love unconditionally. And that is way easier to do from this seat than it is from either of those. Yeah, it's, it's, you can golf clap me. That's totally fine. <laughs> One person was like, that was really good. <laughs> Jesus doesn't leave it up to bait. We are required to love one another as he loved us. Even when we disagree, he didn't leave us ten commandment. He steps in. He's like, whoa, no, 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 no. I'm leaving you one commandment. You are to love one another. And we don't get to pick what that love looks like or sounds like or reacts like. Love one another as I have loved you, like laying your life down. They hadn't done that yet, but he was close. Uh, so you are to love one another. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. These, these guys in the room that he said this in, they have so many differences. If you don't know where this happens in like sort of the timeline of Jesus, um, they're in the upper room, Okay. And he's got Jewish fishermen and a tax collector sitting at the same table. Matthew was a tax collector. He would have been such a hated man in Jewish society because he collected taxes from Jewish people. And, and therefore, he probably stole from good, honest, hardworking Jewish people like Peter, who was a fisherman. And I think if you kind of close your eyes for a second, you can, you can picture this moment. Jesus is at the end of his earthly ministry. He's going to be on the cross by the following afternoon. And they're in the upper room, and they've had dinner, and it was weird. And he's washed their feet, and that was weirder. And then it's right after that moment that he says, just, just love one another. I've showed you how to do it. Now I need you to go do it like I did. And I can picture in my mind as he said this, Peter kind of catches Matthew's eye across the table. And in that moment, they know exactly what he means. I did not like you when you got invited to this thing. You had treated my family badly. 
You didn't trust me. You were unfair to me. You were unkind to me. And, and here we are at the same table. Here we are about to lead a movement together. Here we are about to use our specific giftings to make sure that this message, this love one another message doesn't get lost. They were so different politically, but over the course of three years, they had moved from their respective sides towards that messy middle where the work gets done. And I think they did a pretty good job of it because 2,000 years after it happened, about 6,000 miles away from where it happened, I checked, we are still preaching the message of Jesus. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. When you look at the story of the disciples from a bird's eye view, you can see that Jesus loved them even when they were wrong, even when they had the wrong idea, even when they wanted to do things the wrong way. Jesus loved them even when they were wrong about him. And he feels the same way about you. God loved you even when you were wrong even when you did the wrong thing, even when you treated people badly, even when you were wrong about him. And he's asking you today, I've done that for you. Can you just do that for each other? God loves you in spite of your misinformed, experience-based, evolving views. Because you don't see the world the way you did when you were 15. And you don't see the the world the way you did when you were 25, unless you're 25 now, and then you've got it all figured out, right? Got it all nicely boxed up and buttoned up. It's in there. And the 35-year-olds are like, yeah, right, that's what I thought too. Now I got it all buttoned up. Now I'm good. Now I'm solid. And the 45-year-olds are like, that's cute. (laughs) Because your views are going to keep evolving and changing just like you are going to keep evolving and changing. God is calling us to love each other in spite of our differences, in spite of their misinformed, experience-based, evolving views. This is mission critical for us because we're the ones with the baton now. Peter and Matthew are dead. They ran their race, and now it's our turn. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must, must love one another by loving each other this way regardless by bringing people together that shouldn't like each other, by, by, by loving one another. The last part of this verse says, by this, you will, they will know, the world will know, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How we treat each other, especially when we disagree, is how the world is going to know that we're his. It's easy to get along with people who look like you, think like you, talk like you, sitting next to people who don't look like you, think like you, talk like you, during worship, in a tribe group. When you're sitting next to people who would advocate for something that you oppose, that's something to celebrate. That's the kind of thing that's going to make the messy middle crowded. The Apostle Paul put it like this in his letter to the Galatians. Carry each other's burdens. Do you know what happens when you carry each other's burdens? You start to see the world through their eyes. You start to understand why they think what they think, why they do the things that they do. And when you carry someone else's burden, it causes you to move towards them politically. Because it is really hard to carry a box with your beliefs and your political stances and all of those things when you're carrying someone else's burden. You're going to have to sit one down to pick up the other. And to go back to the question that's kind of been laced through this whole message, what does love require of you? What would love do? What would Jesus do? Paul says that we would carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. When I move towards you and I get up under the burden of your life, even if the things that cause the burden in your life are your own stupid, stubborn fault... That's how we love each other, as Christ loved us. That's how we navigate our political differences without alienating people from the church. When we choose to carry someone else's burden, what divides us diminishes, and what unites us surfaces. And if you're here today, and you're a Jesus follower, that is what you are called to do. If you're here today, and you're a Jesus follower who hasn't done this yet, let me just get ahead of you. It's going to mess you up. It's going to change your worldview. It's going to make you not popular at Christmas, okay? It's just, it's going to happen. 
It's going to loosen your hands around those political views that you thought you had such a handle on. It's going to change your world. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Because this thing, this posture, this attitude, this is the message that changed the world. When our kids were really, really little, we were driving on a country road on a spring night, and the air was filled with fireflies. But they couldn't see them because they were in their car seats. And so we pulled off the road, and we caught a couple, and we released them into the car. And I, I thought my kids were going to delight in seeing them light up as we drove home, but I forgot that they were like one in three. And so instead, my kids lost their ever-loving minds. They were screaming, crying, hiding their faces, trying to jerk out of those like five-point harness car seats. It was pan delirium. It was crazy. They thought they were being attacked. They thought that they were not safe. But they were terrified for no reason at all. They were completely safe and loved and held, but they couldn't imagine it. Both sides of the aisle are going to spend the next couple of months telling you what to be afraid of and who's to blame for it. Don't fall for it. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay no matter who's in the White House. No matter what happens in our nation, we're going to be okay because we know how this story ends. We are all going to wake up on the morning of November November 6th. And the skies might not be sunny, but that'll be because we're in Indiana in November but we're going to wake up and we're going to be okay, even if you can't imagine it right now. No matter what happens, God is still God and God is still good. You are going to be okay, but I want you to stay curious. Curious people are not holding tightly to their political beliefs. Curious people are doing the work, and I want you to be an informed voter. I want you to vote for candidates that you feel good about, and if you don't feel good about a candidate, I don't want you to vote for them. Yeah, that's going to be harder than just voting a straight party ticket. It's going to take more time to check out what both sides of the aisle are saying on their issues and their candidates, but it's worth it if it means you can feel good about the choice that you made. But no matter what, you are one in whom Christ dwells and delights. You live in the strong and unshakable kingdom of God. The kingdom is not in trouble, and neither are you. It has been this way since before you were born. It will be this way long after you left this world. No matter what, God is still God, and God is still good. So I agreed to do this sermon (laughs) if we could end it the way we're about to end it. The band is going to come up with some special guests, and they're going to sing a song. And I encourage you, if you you want to, just, just stay seated. Just let this wash over you. Let this be a prayer for you. Let this song sink deep into your heart and carry it with you as you go throughout this election season. never fails me all my days I have been held in your hand from the moment wake up still I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God (laughs) oh my life 
Amen. 